And what, of course, that means is that at the end of inquiry, although we'll never know when we get to the end of inquiry, there won't be any non-scientific questions left unanswered. And so there won't be any philosophical, any distinctively philosophical questions left. Um, but since we're nowhere near that point, and since humanity probably won't last long enough to get anywhere near that point, the enduring value of philosophy remains unimpaired. Welcome everyone to today's interview, where we are very pleased to welcome Professor Alex Rosenberg. He is our Taylor Cole Professor of Philosophy at Duke University. His research focuses primarily on philosophy of biology and science more generally, mind, economics, and some related issues. His books include The Philosophy of Science, The Philosophy of Pol Political Science, The Atheist Guide to Reality, Enjoying Life Without Illusions, uh, how History Gets Things Wrong, The Neuroscience of Our Addiction to Stories, Reduction in Mechanism, and others. He also has a variety of published articles. Feel free to add anything, but with that, welcome and thanks so much for being here, Professor Rosenberg. Thanks for having me. I don't need to add anything to that introduction. We can get right into what we'd like to talk about. Sure. So, uh, awesome. <laughs> As a, to start, maybe just like a general question about your philosophical approach. You've said that you accept uh, a sort of scientism. Um, how would you exactly construe this thesis and, and why do you find it compelling? So the normal definition of scientism is twofold. It's the unreasonable uh, attribution to science of reliability or sole reliability in the acquisition of knowledge and the methods of science in that acquisition and the equally unreasonable um, a conclusion that what the sciences tell us about the nature of reality um, is the last or the best word about it. And the scientistic philosopher, that's me, um, accepts that definition, accepts, except that uh, we withdraw the word unreasonable from the two-part definition. So we think that the only way to acquire knowledge of the nature of reality is by the methods of science broadly construed, and that what science tells us about the nature of reality uh, is the truth, uh, that to the degree that other views are incompatible with the most reasonable conclusions of scientific inquiry, those views are undermined as unreasonable. And uh, by and large, that uh, does tend to undermine a lot of uh, widely held theories through the history of philosophy and widely held current theories among philosophers. Now, why do I believe it? Well, it seems to me that the, the most manifest fact about our culture and civilization is the not only success of science in predicting and explaining um, uh, uh, phenomena in ways that answer the most exigent questions that we have, but the almost universal acceptance of this peculiarly Western invention by all the other cultures and civilizations on our planet, uh, even though there's nothing else that we have conferred upon mankind, and we've conferred some awful things as well as some wonderful things, um, that has secured such widespread acceptance and emulation. Right. Yeah, that's interesting. So like the basic, the basic motivation is just, it works, it's successful. It's like, it seems to be the best sort of explanation. Well, that, that would be, but that would be um, to somehow endorse a pragmatism. Mm -hmm. uh, Whereas my own view and the scientism that I espouse uh, takes metaphysics and the explanatory obligations of metaphysics seriously. Uh, and it says that there's an explanation for why science works so that um, uh, pragmatism uh, is uh, not a natural stopping point 
in uh, the endorsement of the scientific worldview and the epistemology that we can read off of scientific uh, success. Um, the success is explained by something and the explanation is also given by science. Okay, all right. Yeah, interesting. <laughs> and uh, on a related note, you've also called yourself, I think you would call yourself a naturalist. Um, otherwise, as you know, surely such terms like physicalism have been historically somewhat difficult to define um, in a way both plausibly true and deserving of the name as Daniel Stoljar might put it. Um, and, and I think you have a paper from the 90s exploring some of the varieties of naturalism. Um, what do you think now? Do you have a specific thesis in mind or is it more like a um, vague stance with some methodological commitments and, and constraints like uh, the minds aren't fundamental and stuff like that. So I, I view scientism, the, this view that I endorse and that almost nobody else endorses as a species or a subcategory of naturalism. Uh, naturalism is basically, um, uh, again, an epistemic and a metaphysical view that accords a special place to science and seeks to reconcile the manifest image as Wilfred Sellers called it um, with the scientific image. Uh, and uh, the differences among various naturalists are not only about the degree of uh, success of this reconciliation, but the details of the reconciliation. So um, there will be a variety of different views about naturalizing the intentional, um, teleosemantic, uh, uh, among uh, other views. Um, and uh, among naturalists, there is uh, an in-house set of disputes about the best ways to proceed, and particularly about uh, not only the nature of mind and its relation to the brain, but also about normative matters like matters of ethics and meta-ethics. And um, in this broad uh, naturalistic um, uh, camp, uh, there are views on the various extremes of the spectrum. Uh, and I'm inclined to say that scientism is on one end of the spectrum. And it's the spectrum that holds that where the problems appear to be grave and longstanding, we ought to let science trump the manifest image and simply stigmatize it as wrong, as incorrect, as um, uh, superstition. And of course, on the other end of the spectrum, there are a lot of naturalists of whom probably Dan Dennett is the most wonderful example, um, who still hold out hope of reconciling more adequately or more fully the manifest image with the scientific worldview. Right, so is it, are you sort of construing naturalism as, as a range of, um, like methodological commitments or something like that? As I think it's both methodological and substantive. So uh, uh, of course it's, it, it strongly suggests that the right method for acquiring answers to our um, persistent questions uh, is with the tools of natural science, but that at least in the hands of many naturalists some of those answers won't be particularly alien to common sense. Say, you know, questions about the nature of color. There are many naturalists who um, want to insist that colors are really out there in the world, provided we understand that claim correctly. There are other naturalists who say, no, colors are subjected in us. And this has been uh, the right view in philosophy since Locke. Um, the dispute between naturalists about an issue like that seems to me to be largely an in-house dispute. Um, it's uh, people like Chalmers, for example, who tell us that uh, colors are subjective qualia um, and they can't be given any kind of uh, um, naturalistic, uh, physicalistic account who are beyond the pale of naturalism. Right. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And you, you, you also argued that they're like, relatedly, that there's no intentionality, or in some sense, it doesn't. So this is, a, that, that's a nice example, too, where um, 
there are many different naturalistic approaches to intentionality. Um, there was this wonderful article or talk given many, many years ago by, uh, um, was it John Hoagland entitled, uh, um, What It's Like to Be at Bat, uh, the, the Intentionality All-Stars, in which he lays out a large number of different alternatives, some of which are completely non-naturalistic. So for example, Searles, even though he himself says that the brain produces intentionality the way the stomach produces digestion and that he's a physicalist, but when you actually try to cash in the details, there's no there there. Um, but within the, the naturalistic um, camp, as I've said from Dennett, um, pretty much you know, on the left, as an instrumentalist about intentionality, uh, uh, all the way across to people who take it seriously and still want to um, cash it in for a real phenomena like Ruth Millikan. Um, uh, those, uh, those naturalists can't be construed as eliminativists. The eliminativists are few and far between. The Churchlands have soft peddled their eliminativism over the years, um, uh, but they're still eliminativists, and so am I. And um, you certainly don't have to be an eliminativist to be a naturalist, but um, it seems to me that eliminativism is the right conclusion to be drawn from the difficulties and obstacles that naturalism about the intentional faces. Yeah. Yeah, and, and you've made some interesting arguments to this, to the, for this conclusion. I was, I was wondering what you think of, of the following sort of response, which is basically just like a, a Murian shift. If someone says, okay, I mean, your, your argument is maybe valid, but I have a much stronger commitment to intentionality than to um, this naturalistic view. And so maybe I should give up that or some other step in the argument that, that entails this conclusion. I mean, um, what may you say in response to this uh, to this objection? Well, I I think you know one you, the simple thing to say is you pays your money and it takes your choice. If you really have that starting point, there's probably no way that I can rationally disabuse you of it. However, from the point of view of naturalism, from the point of view of cognitive science, from the point of view of um, cognitive social psychology, the uncritical acceptance of the claims of introspection are so uh, fraught and so uh, unlikely to be substantiated and uh, produce such intractable puzzles that nobody should, in my opinion, take introspection as the serious basis for any philosophical starting point. Introspection is a problem. It's not a premise. Um, and uh, uh, a Morian uh, digging in of the heels, here's a hand and here's another. Um, uh, they haven't impressed me since I was a 20 year old graduate student. Fair enough. Um, and, and two, I was wondering what you might say on like uh, two other somewhat common objections to the limitivist view. Um, or, and, and that all attributions of, of intentionality are like merely instrumental. Um, so first, um, doesn't seem that even the, the thesis can be stated given its truth, right? I mean, undermining the whole dialectic maybe. And second, an instrumental attribution of intentionality is still an intentional act in the relevant sense. And so doesn't that seem to undermine the thesis that there's no intentionality? I mean, I know well, these are maybe difficult questions, but yeah, sorry. Well, they are difficult questions and they've been advanced against eliminativists since the early 90s. The uh, nicest examples are Paul Bogosian and Lynn Rudder Baker. And it is not as though in, uh, eliminativists are e ignorant of these arguments and at least in some cases do not um, feel the obligation to address them. I certainly have felt the obligation to address them and I've written papers ever since the 90s um, on these topics. Indeed, I'd say, after, especially I wrote the, uh, um, the book, uh, How History Gets Things Wrong, The Neuroscience of Our Addiction to Stories, which is a heavily disguised argument for 
illuminativism, heavily disguised because it seeks to uh, uh, to draw in people who are interested in um, the problems and the vicissitudes of historical explanation and to ground historical explanation on our own introspectively uh, grounded theory of mind uh, and then to unravel the theory of mind and show that that's the basis of the problems in accepting historical explanation. Um, so I know perfectly well that uh, at least some philosophers will dig their heels in and say, just as you have, that this theory is self-refuting or self-stultifying. Um, now, um, I could, and I'd be happy to send to any of the people who are watching the program tonight, a paper on this subject that I wrote about six or eight months ago, um, uh, entitled, How to Be an Eliminativist. Mm -hmm. and. Um, after sort of sketching out the broad um, reasons that neuroscience strongly sustains eliminativism and the defects in the argument from introspection for eliminativism, I go on to address these two Boghossian-like and Lynn Rudder Baker-like uh, claims that it's self-refuting. Um, part of the argument has to do with some fairly complicated uh, issues that arise in uh, competing theories of truth, discretational theories and correspondence theories. Um, and uh, until or unless we get our um, theories of truth in order and decide which of them is the right theory, it's going to be as premature to uh, stigmatize um, eliminativism as self-contradictory because uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, it instantiates certain obvious contradictions and cannot, uh, since it denies the semantic evaluability of sentences, help itself to the statement that it is itself true, okay? These mm -hmm. kinds of problems, the problems of self-reference and um, uh, metalinguistic or discortational theories of, of truth, um, make it difficult for us to evaluate the, uh, the claims of eliminativism, uh, given that we're sophisticated enough philosophers to know that we don't yet have a widely accepted, entirely reliable account of the nature of truth against the background of which to say that these theories can't be true because they are self-defeating. Self now, um, that's a pretty complicated issue to um, insist needs to be solved before we get to be eliminativists. Um, but the eliminativists can certainly say, um, just as um, we need uh, uh, an account of uh, human behavior that's free from intentional uh, idioms, okay, um, uh, that we may also want an account of intentional, of, of semantic behavior that helps itself or exploits the theory of truth, of the nature of truth that isn't, um, that doesn't pre present these obvious self, self referential problems. And uh, uh, holding those at arm's length, we won't take seriously the claims that this doctrine is incoherent. Now that, that's a, a long and a complicated answer. Uh, and I probably should have gone back and reread this paper that I wrote about six months ago, but I do welcome your viewers sending me emails and I'll be happy to send it to them. Meanwhile, um, I think it's important to recognize that this is like many problems in philosophy, um, uh, an unsolved one, but uh, that fact, in and by itself shouldn't prevent us from continuing to suppose that eliminativism can at some point or other um, uh, uh, circum, um, circumnavigate uh, or at any rate uh, get around this issue. It's like um, suppose that um, someone taxed physics with the claim that Zeno's paradoxes have not yet been refuted and therefore 
physics can't help itself to the concept of motion. Um, uh, you might agree, as Adolf Grunbaum um, uh, suggested, that we don't have a good and complete and completely non-controversial non solution to Zeno's paradoxes. Should we await such a solution before accepting um, the existence of motion? Probably not. Right. So, yeah, I mean, so I guess what's going on there is that, um, well, if we have good enough reasons to accept this thesis, and okay, there's some sort of concerns, unsolved problems maybe, but they're not so pressing that they undermine the, the evidence we have for the thesis overall. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's sort of left as a, maybe a promissory note that, you know, we'll have something or, or we could have some way to deal with those problems in the future. It's like- Yeah, I, I'm particularly you know, inclined to say that a disrotational theory um, is, is going to help very much uh, in enabling us to express eliminativism without, you know, the obvious sophomoric um, self-refutation arguments. Yeah, um, that's interesting. I, I'll have to check that paper out. That's not one of the ones I read in preparation. For. No, it's 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 not out. Oh, oh fair enough. <laughs> it's it's just that's why I'm happy to send it to people. Oh, awesome. And. A few months ago, I talked with David Papineau um, regarding his um, then recent, I guess still re relatively recent book called The Metaphysics of Sensory Experience. And there he describes a view of intentionality um, according to which certain mental states, perceptual and to some extent otherwise, um, come to be about things due to a sort of directed teleological development of, right. and of correlations between those states and things in the world. It's a causal you, theory of intentionality, right? right? One in which he denies that. intentionality to the internal qualitative character of the experience. Right, right. At least intrinsically, it's not. Um, it has it uh, um, contingently uh, um, anyway. And um, I know you've been critical of like teleosemantic views and um, and a, a, another realist naturalist views of intentionality. But I mean, what do you think of this approach, at least uh, broadly construed? I was heavily influenced by that book, in fact, mm. um, in thinking about the second of the three parts of the paper that I've mentioned to you, the, the denial of uh, uh, the role of introspection in the grounding of intentionality. And I think that David's arguments are very powerful and very attractive. Um, where I get off the bus is that um, while he doesn't specifically endorse a teleosemantic approach, his view is very easily harnessed together with one, um, either Millikan's or Neander's or Fred Gretzky's. Um, and while I honor these theories as probably as close as we can possibly come to intentionality, because they are driven by the right science, that is by Darwinian natural selection as the most important scientific tool in explaining the mind, um, they nevertheless do not produce um, the kind of uh, fine-grained, um, semantically evaluable propositional attitudes that would be required in order for naturalism to give us intentionality. Um, and here, uh, uh, you may laugh, but I find myself making common cause with um, um, Jerry Fodor in his last book, um, but I run that argument as a modus tollens. That is to say, Fodor gave an argument against the theory of natural selection on the grounds that it could not discriminate between propositions that were coextensive. Mm. And it couldn't distinguish between properties that were coextensive, uh, um, properties that are coextensive or, uh, or the, the truth makers of propositions. And I tend to agree with that, but that's because I'm an eliminativist. I infer from the fact that our best scientific theory can't make those discriminations, that those discriminations don't exist. They are illusory. Um, so uh, all honor to teleosemantics in the hands of Ruth Millikan or Dan Dennett or Karen Neander. Um, uh, it's as close as we're going to be able to come to understanding uh, the what's going on in the brain that produces the 
impression in us that there is content in thought. Um, and of course, a good deal of uh, the, that book that you mentioned, that I mentioned, How History Gets Things Wrong, especially the three chapters about neuroscience, try to vindicate that view, that there's nothing in the neural circuitry that will uh, substantiate the attribution of intentional states, even though that neural circuitry is the result of um, phylogenetic processes and ontogenetic processes of the kind that the teleosemantic theories describe. Sorry for such a long no, answer. That's, that's a great answer. That's a, and a lot of very interesting points there. And you mentioned um, Fodor. I actually have a couple, uh, a couple questions about that. But um, I first want to ask one more related question, because um, uh, so while you're an eliminativist about intentionality, you're I take it not eliminatives, eliminatives about consciousness altogether. Um, however, a critic might say that, well, shouldn't the same sort of arguments apply? I mean, how does consciousness fit into a world of particles, fields, and whatever? Um, how can a bunch of neurons say be such that there is something it is like to be them? Um, well, I think that actually um, cognitive ne neuropsychologists have made considerable advances in our understanding of consciousness. Um, I've spent a lot of time this summer reading a couple of books. There's the Yablanka um, et al. book about the evolution of, um, of consciousness uh, deep in uh, metazoan phylogeny um, and uh, uh, on any number of works that have been written in the last couple of years, uh, analyzing consciousness into attention and awareness um, where attention and awareness are both um, uh, mental processes that can be effectively cached in without appeal to qualia or to uh, subjective, um, uh, ex uh, ineliminably non-physical ex uh, experiential um, data. Um, I recognize that uh, the Chalmers hard problem represents a challenge uh, to naturalists and even more so to eliminativists. And I'm willing to accept that challenge. Nobody understands consciousness. And to suggest that um, that that, that um, encourages dualism as an intelligible alternative just seems to me fatuous. Dualism is merely throwing up your hands and saying there's no explanation here. Um, and I presume that consciousness is not so basic and brute a phenomena that there couldn't be any explanation. Um, uh, and I'm certainly not going to give panpsychism the time of day. Um, so uh, I don't want to deny the existence of consciousness. I do hold out the hope that we're going to be able to um, characterize it scientifically by appeal to some kind of a theory that uh, starts with uh, global workplace um, approach and um, exploits what we understand about, about attention and awareness of attention. Um, uh, I rather like Michael Graziano's books on this subject, and um, I'm more likely to think that Paul Carruthers has got the right answers about consciousness than any other philosopher I know. Um, but I don't want to deny that there's consciousness. And in particular, I don't want to deny that there are feelings, emotions. I think that sensations and emotions are particularly important um, facts about us, which uh, natural selection has shaped in ways that enable human life to persist on the planet and uh, social and uh, cooperative endeavors to, uh, to be undertaken. Um, and so I, I'm not inclined to be an eliminativist about consciousness. Um, I'm just inclined to be an eliminativist about its being intentional. Yeah, that's, that's a bunch of fair points. And I'm, I mean, I'm probably on the same page as you on, on um, pretty much all of that, but I mean, you could sort of see um, where the, a critic might be coming from here is like, well, um, on your view, we have this sort of pervasive um, illusion of intentionality, but it doesn't fit well into a, or we have good reason to think it doesn't fit into a, a naturalistic picture. And so we reject it because we have strong commitment to that. 
I mean, but I mean, they're going to try to make the same argument that conscious doesn't fit well into a naturalistic picture as well. I mean, but you think you want to push back on maybe that claim and say it's so, yeah. Um, the first question um, that seems sensible to ask about consciousness is what's its function? And most probably it doesn't have a single function. Consciousness is a congeries of a, of a variety of different mental activities, any one of which uh, may have been an adaptation with a selective effects etiology that brought it into existence and combined it uh, in various kinds of compromises with other psychological activities that were essential for mammalian or primate or um, uh, homo sapien survival. Um, whereas I don't see that intentionality is something uh, that we could clearly attribute a function to. Intentionality is a, a feature, or maybe it's not a feature of consciousness. Um, and um, I don't feel the same scientific obligation to explain it uh, owing to its contribution to survival that I feel uh, the, the necessity of in the case of consciousness. Yeah, fair enough. Um, definitely some, some more issues to explore there, but I, um, as I said, I wanted to turn to um, what, you've, what you've said on Jerry Fodor, and mm -hmm. I guess that book was co-authored with uh, Massimo Piatelli Palmarini, but <laughs> Arguments Against Natural Selection. And uh, for those listening, uh, just as a brief over overview, um, they argue, roughly speaking, that natural selection as an explanatory theory is meant to explain, among other things, which features, genotypic and phenotypic, are selected for and not merely selected, um, but that it cannot do so. And so it, it fails as an explanatory hypothesis in that regard, at least. Uh, so, I mean, there's more that obviously they, they say on it, but that's part of the, the center of their argument. Um, and I take it that the meat of your response is to say um, that natural selection does not require explanations of this sort, um, that selection against is good enough, um, and Fodor's arguments don't work against selection against. I mean, first of all, do I have the sort of dialectic in your response roughly right or? Um, I think uh, maybe the way I put it in uh, the arguments that I gave at a conference on this subject in Santa Barbara are roughly the way you described, and you can find a YouTube version of the talk that I gave there as well as a, um, the paper was published, and I can't remember where um, uh, thereafter. But um, there's a deeper philosophical problem here. We tend, our predicates, Predicates of our natural languages may or may not pick out properties, real kinds, natural kinds, okay? Um, and uh, we have uh, probably, in most cases, failed to pick out with our predicates real kinds in nature because we've been selected for uh, uh, identifying those uh, or employing those property terms uh, in behaviors which get selected for. Um, and natural selection is very good at selecting for behaviors that are adaptive, but not very good for selecting for true beliefs. Okay, or even if I'm right, for beliefs, right? Mm -hmm. um, still less for selecting for acquisition or identification of the real properties of things. Um, uh, at best, natural selection has resulted in our um, constructing and invoking a large number of predicates which happen to be uh, selectively valuable in uh, uh, assuring our survival. Um, if you say all that, then um, you recognize that uh, when Fodor shows, as he does and did even long ago when he was arguing against teleological theories of content, in the late 80s and early 90s. It's the same damn argument, only now he's using it against Darwin instead of against the application of Darwin in the philosophy of psychology. If Fodor shows that natural selection can't discriminate between certain human predicates, 
that tells us really nothing about whether natural selection can or cannot discriminate against or in favor of real properties in nature. Because the, the, the most that natural selection is going to explain is how we glommed on to various predicates that may be useful or not useful for us. You know, Gru and Bleen aren't as useful as green and blue. Does it follow therefore that green and blue identify real properties out there in the world? Well, obviously since Locke, we've known that they didn't. And yet the mistaken view that they do is highly adaptive to organisms of our species. Um, should we infer um, that it's a defect of natural selection, that it can't ground the distinction between green and blue as properties out there in the world? Of course not. And I think that's gonna go for any predicate of natural language that you identify. And that's why it's more reasonable to run a modus polens, uh, tollens against Fodor than to take his argument against natural selection seriously. You know, I began that paper uh, that you mentioned with uh, an interesting parallel, I say, you know, when a, when a really great scientist uh, says something that's manifestly false, okay, it's really worthwhile exploring in detail why the scientist said it and what its implications are. And then the instance I give is the EPR, the Einstein Rosen Podlowski mm -hmm. paper, in which Einstein in the 30s said, look, either quantum mechanics is incomplete or there's spooky action at a distance. Okay, and everybody made fun of Einstein in that paper for many years until John Bell showed that there was a fact of the matter here. And then it took another 20 years to do the experiment to show that there is spooky action at a distance. And we would have never have done that if it hadn't been for this wonderful paper by Einstein. And of course, what it did was show Einstein was very farsighted and deeply mistaken about the nature of the, the alleged incompleteness of quantum mechanics. Now I suggest we treat the sainted Jerry Fodor the same way. That is, take his argument that purports to show that natural selection can't discriminate between properties, actually between predicates of natural languages um, and run it backwards. Yeah, so let me make it clear on something. You're saying that um, there there isn't selection for with respect to the um, uh, the properties we describe using the predicates of our natural language, or um, there isn't selection for there's at all. Selection. There's going to be selection for the use of certain predicates, and sometimes our use of those predicates is so successful that a realist explanation um, makes very appealing the claim that the predicates are successful because they identify real properties in nature. And this will be particularly true for the properties that figure in the natural kinds of physics and chemistry and biology, okay? But they probably won't go further than that. Right, but you do wanna say that there are properties and kinds in nature, or do you not want to say that? Yes, I, well, I'm perfectly happy to say that, but, yeah. you know, I'd rather be a nominalist, but I can't, <laughs> you know, and that's, you know, that, that, that's a whole other kettle of metaphysical fish, so to speak. Right, but then... But the, point, the point is, the point I want to make is, is uh, we, ne we shouldn't be too confident about the manifest image, and not only shouldn't we be very confident about the manifest image, we need to really take seriously the degree to which uh, natural science undermines it, okay? And that may mean uh, not taking as any more than convenient fictions and heuristic devices uh, much more than um, uh, those uh, properties that characterize human superstitions, common sense, uh, and other widespread beliefs. Right, right, and, and, but but with respect to whatever um, the real properties or uh, features of, of things in the world, um, do you want to say that there's selection against and selection for those uh, by natural selection or? No, well, I don't think natural selection uh, 
is a mechanism that creates properties, right? Um, right. It might create instantiations of um, of sentences and predicates, but you know the properties are out there or they're not, and it's not a matter of the process of blind variation and environmental filtration to create properties. At most, it'll create um, uh, cognitive states or epistemic states. And I have to be careful when I say epistemic states because I, mm. I, I want to recognize that there are epistemic states that are not intentional. Right. But just thinking- And then like I actually wrote a paper with an impossible title many years ago called um, a naturalistic epistemology for eliminative materialists, <laughs> yeah. in which I tried to do that very thing. Right. I mean, but I'm just thinking like independently of um, our epistemic activities or, you know, the predicates we have. I'm, normally, we, we want to say something like, um, I don't know, take the evolution of a giraffe and how it, um, over generations, they had longer necks. Um, we want to say that there was selection for that trait. Uh, is that not something we can start to say? say that. No. Um, and when we use the, um, the, the predicate longer neck, okay, uh, we um, can be understood as employing the apparatus of referential and or attributive um, predication, okay? And so, you know, here again, the complications of our use of language um, should be things that the evolutionary biologists can, can totally prescind from and which we philosophers might want to keep in the back of our mind. But um, I don't want to get into an argument about whether when I point to the long neck of giraffe, I am uh, uh, making a referential or an attributive uh, claim in the Keith Danellan sense of the word. And here again, we're going back to ancient history and the philosophy language. Um, uh, and I certainly don't want the issue of whether selection uh, increases the length of giraffes' necks over phylogenetic history to be held hostage to an argument like photos. And I'm perfectly happy to be to uh, to speak with the vulgar, at least to the extent of saying that natural selection um, selects for and selects against the instantiation of properties. Right. So I would, would you say that that speak of selection against is still speaking with the vulgar in a way? Because it sounded, at least when I was first reading the paper, it, it seemed to me like you were saying that, no, 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 there really is a selection against um, and selection for, um, at least that's not something that natural selection is meant to explain. Well, all right. So um, now we're into the weeds of the philosophy of biology. Mm -hmm. um, if the environment filters um, for uh, uh, survival, okay, it's going to allow to survive to the next generation every organism with traits that are just good enough to survive, including you know ones that are wonderfully adapted and those that are poorly adapted but still not maladapted, okay, and it's just going to eliminate the, uh, those organisms that are maladaptive, that cannot survive, right? Now, um, if that's the case, then it will allow into the next generation uh, a, a range of attributes, some of which are very fit, some of which are minimally adapted, okay? But it's going to certainly eliminate the maladapted ones. And I think if we look at natural selection, that way we'll understand more clearly the way the sense in which it is not a creative force at all but only a winnowing one right and i think that's that that's the way i think we should um understand the distinction between selection for and selection against natural selection selects against and anything that is not selected against is by definition selected for or at least weakly selected for yeah weakly yeah, yeah. yeah. indifference right right and yeah, that's right. And I was wondering, um, but, but what if what if someone were to say that this this filtering process, the selection against, or if we want to call it like anti-selection, is still maybe intentional in the relevant sense? So like, um, 
we could we could draw the distinction between like anti-selection for uh, maybe traits which are filtered out because of their contributions to the reduction of fitness or something like that, and traits which are merely anti-selected, um, traits which are maybe coextensive with the in the relevant sense with traits which are which contribute to a reduction of fitness. I mean, if this is a fair distinction to make, um, and um, should natural selection not be able to distinguish between these cases of selection against? Well, uh, um, fine-grained natural selection operating long enough is going to make discriminations uh, even against traits which are locally coextensive, because if there are costs associated with the carrying along of, a, of one trait by another trait that's selected for, there's going to be some kind of an arms race or some kind of a mutation, which is going to separate them sufficiently for natural selection to act. And if natural selection can't ever act against them, then that seems to me to be evidence that they are equally adaptive. That makes sense? Hmm. Yeah, I think so. I have to think about it a little bit more, but... Uh, now, you know, I, I've been, I, I actually have written a paper about this with uh, Ben Sinane, um, and uh, it has been submitted several times to several different journals and always rejected. So you're uh, perhaps prescient to press this point because it's a nice issue in the philosophy of biology. Um, and it's one that at any rate, Benz and I have been unable to convince the referees of good journals to accept. Right. I'm not sure what the issue has to do with uh, any kind of uh, argument from natural selection for intentionality or any argument against natural selection from mm. the existence of intentional states, which yeah. is for what, where Fodor is going. You know, when Fodor first advanced these arguments, it was against teleosemantics, okay? And it should have taken him less than 20 years to figure out that his real target was natural selection and not teleosemantics. Right. Um, was, that, was that Ben Snane that you mentioned? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. And I was, um, as you had some other paper um, co authored with uh, it, uh, Karen Neander, right? I don't know the name you yes. Mm -hmm. Discussing, yeah, uh, the notion of function, a biological function. And um, you end up defending, it seems, a, a count on which, roughly speaking, um, a trait X has some function F. If there was, selection for performing F on traits ancestral to X in its lineage, something like that. And, um, but are we requiring selection for here? I mean, is this- Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, well, certainly- this potentially in the papers, yeah. yeah. In the papers that I wrote with Karen, um, a couple of them, they certainly are predicated on, on the coherence of selection for. Um, right. Uh, and I, I, I guess I am not at this point ready to go to the mat for the claim that there's only selection against. Um, partly, uh, 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 if I haven't convinced referees, they have increasingly led me to be um, doubtful or hesitant about pushing the negative thesis. And for purposes of the the systematization of the biologist's employment of the concept of function, which I'm sure that Karen got right. And in those two papers, I was simply, I was helping her construct arguments for those views. Um, we are not engaged in a fundamental um, rethink at the basement level of the philosophy of biology. We're more interested in systematizing the actual use of um, these concepts among biologists, and they're certainly on board with selection four. Right, uh, fair enough. And, and sort of another remark about um, the um, the responses you've given here. Um, might this not seem to suggest some sort of skepticism about a lot of the claims we make uh, about the etern uh, the world? Like, I mean, I guess. <laughs> I mean, talking about claims here, maybe this is um, not to 
assume intentionality, but when we say no, that no, we, things we can, are a certain we, way, we yeah. Those words. Oh, we, we can speak with the vulgar. Hmm. Right, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. I don't actually see why do they threaten the general view, the, the set of views that we were talking about before. Well, it's, it's not that they're um, threatening those views. It's just that, um, I don't know, whenever we talk about um, what the external world is like and use apply predicates to things and so on, um, uh, it, sound, it seemed to me at least that you were suggesting that um, we shouldn't take a lot of those predicates too seriously. Maybe that's not really what the world is like. Yeah, we need to take the predicates of, of the natural sciences seriously mm. um, as identifying natural kinds. And the reason we need to is because they're systematized in effective theories uh, that are well confirmed um, and therefore our best uh, uh, approximation to the truth, but uh, when it comes to most of the predicates beyond the natural sciences, um, uh, there is no such a pedigree of reliability that would underwrite very strong claims about the properties so named. Right. Oh, so when I say something like my computer monitor is rectangular, right, is that what, what does that fall more under? That, that doesn't seem like that's that's common sense. So you, one of your previous guests was Peter Van Inwagen, mm -hmm. and I think we scientific philosophers are inclined to take very seriously Peter Van Inwagen's arguments against the existence and the coherence of our notions of physical objects. Why? Because we we think you know the most reliable. Um, epistemic or reliable starting point for any systematization of the world is going to be logic. And if um, uh, we, the, if the concept of a physical object leads us to intractable problems about numerical identity of physical objects, then let's adopt a different view. And of course we can use the, the physical object language, but understanding that what we're really talking about are Simples arranged chair wise. <laughs> right. I mean, so that's, you would um, accept what Van Ingwagen has to say about um, material objects there. I guess you would also extend it to uh, organic things in, in the way that he doesn't. I think I would, yeah. Mm -hmm. Except I, I get off the, I'm not happy with the idea of, uh, with Peter's idea of, uh, um, uh, the combination of simples and of living things, because mm. right? I find that, uh, that that's not a distinction that naturalism can help itself to. Right, they're all, you know, fundamentally made out of the same stuff. It's just arranged right. differently. <laughs> mm -hmm. They're undergoing different processes. Yeah, um, that's an interesting point. I think um, maybe a couple questions, and then we can wrap up and. I'm not sure what you're talking. I'm surprised we haven't gotten to uh, nice nihilism and ethics. <laughs> yeah, I, I haven't. Um, I was thinking about asking something about that, but I was going to put it into a sort of maybe more general question at the end about. Well, you're driving. You're driving this interview, <laughs> not me. Fair enough. Um, um, yeah, maybe I'll ask that now. Like, it's. it's I mean, it's not really about about um, uh, ethics. Um, but uh, more a general metaphilosophical question about um, what the, the value of doing philosophy is um, um, and what value philosophy has to us individually and as a society. I mean, it's sort of a question about um, related to, um, well, values or related to ethics, but more specifically about. So I, I, I'm a Quinean. Um, and as a Quinean, I think of philosophy as just very abstract and very general science. And so the answer to that question is whatever value science and the expansion of human understanding that's um, uh, driven by scientific advance is concerned, that's, that value also accrues to philosophy. Um, what, was it Wilfred Sellers again who said, you know, philosophy is supposed to tell us how in the broadest, how broadly speaking things hang together. Um, well, that's what science is supposed to tell us. And, Philosophy is um, 
addresses those questions that the sciences have yet to uh, uh, find themselves in a position systematically to address and to make sort of, if not predictions at any rate, arguments about what strategies the sciences ought to use in addressing those questions. Um, and what of course that means is that at the end of inquiry, although we'll never know when we get to the end of inquiry, there won't be any non-scientific questions left unanswered. And so there won't be any philosophical, any distinctively philosophical questions left. Um, but since we're nowhere near that point, and since humanity probably won't last long enough to get anywhere near that point, the enduring value of philosophy remains unimpaired. Right. Yeah, and, 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 and a critic might say that like, well, this naturalistic uh, Darwinian picture um, seems to support a nihilistic view of, uh, uh, regarding the meaningless, meaning, meaninglessness of life and so forth. What, why is that consistent with saying that, well, these sorts of um, empirical intellectual endeavors are, are worth doing this, uh, this is these are things that we value um, well to say that we value them is quite different from saying they're worth doing to say we mm -hmm. value them is to say that we have subjective uh, uh, emotional attitudes that drive our behavior uh, in ways that advance our the scientific agenda and I certainly assert that very firmly um, can we go beyond the human emotional drives that expand uh, human knowledge to some kind of a, a value under the aspect of eternity um, that makes uh, meaningful uh, our uh, uh, civilization and its most uh, uh, magnificent ornaments like natural science? The answer is no. Um, in that respect, I think uh, uh, nihilism mm -hmm if that's nihilism is the right view of things um, and it's uh, self-deception to think otherwise. Now, this is an, another area in which the scientific philosopher differs from other naturalists. So you've got, whether it's Sam Harris, who's not a philosopher, but for these purposes takes views that we take seriously or Dan Dennett or other people who say that we can make sense um, Darwinian sense indeed of the meaning of life. That's the subtitle of Dan's great uh, book, Darwin's Dangerous Idea. Um, and um, it's a dispute that remains at least unresolved uh, and in which um, we scientific philosophers continue to be a minority. Um, it's, uh, I'm rather ashamed to say that the paper of mine written with Tamler Summers uh, discussing Dan's claim to the uh, to the effect that Darwin will convey or provide some meaningfulness to life, that that paper is more widely cited by evangelical Christians and, and, and fundamentalist opponents of Darwinism than any other paper I've ever written. Um, uh, and um, uh, nevertheless, I, I, it may have had, maybe it had a, a an unfavorable effect in, in reducing acceptance of naturalism. Um, uh, and if that's true, I'm sorry, and might well in retrospect withdraw it or wish it had never been published, but I still believe it's true. Fair enough. And yeah, I definitely agree with a lot of what you say there. Like um, for, to have the, the values that we have, the motivations that we have to engage in, sort of, in certain intellectual endeavors and so forth, what difference does it make and why would we be better off if there's some like cosmic value to some of the things we're exploring? I, I just don't see, <laughs> I, I think no, I'm on the same page as you. It's like, what? You know. Well, and, and there are many other arguments for the same conclusion that have nothing to do with scientism or naturalism. Mm -hmm. You know, um, uh, Parfit's arguments at the end of Reasons and Persons, uh, the dismal conclusion, um, uh, those arguments are sufficiently disturbing, okay, that they, you know, they pull out the rug from underneath a lot of uh, um, Pollyanna-like uh, uh, hopes for the amelioration of the human condition uh, as we endlessly expand populations and the use of resources and the generation of entropy. Um, 
you know, maybe the solution to problems of global warming involve us walking back in the, in very opposite directions. Um, and um, uh, I think the nihilist, the nice nihilist is prepared to be more comfortable with those outcomes than um, other more optimistic views about the human trajectory. Yeah, that's, you've given me a lot to think about there. I think uh, we'll, it's been a great interview. I think we'll wrap up the questions there. Um, yeah, thanks so much for, for being here and taking my questions, offering your, your thoughtful responses. Well, it's, it's my pleasure. And I have to say that I've done this uh, several other times uh, in the past and people can find um, the online versions. Um, but I think you've given me uh, more opportunity to expound these views in ways that uh, are illuminating, mm -hmm. especially to other philosophy students than a lot of these other interviews. So um, full speed ahead for you. Uh, and I look forward to, to listening to your doing the same job uh, with a lot of other more distinguished philosophers than me.